Funding for This Is Nashville comes from you, our listeners, and Alliance Bernstein. Since 2019, employees have impacted our community by giving more than 5,000 hours of volunteerism in Middle Tennessee. AllianceBernstein.com. Alliance Bernstein is not affiliated with National Public Radio. I'm Khalil A. Colonna, and this is Nashville. Today, we have Nashville Mayor Freddie O'Connell in the studio. You know how it goes, Nashville. We offer you an opportunity to talk with the mayor directly, to ask him questions or address your concerns. How is the transit referendum coming? What's he planning to do on Juneteenth? Is the mayor getting rest? If it's important to you, you have the chance to talk about it with Mayor O'Connell. And later this hour, we'll have our city's nightmare, Mr. Benton McDonough, join us to talk about what the nightmare does and answer your questions on all things downtown. So to talk with either of the mayors, dial 615-760-2000. Again, that's 615-760-2000. With that, allow me to welcome Nashville's 10th mayor, Mr. Freddie O'Connell, back to this is Nashville. Welcome, Mayor O'Connell. Khalil, great to be back. I'm impressed that you got Benton in during the day. Usually, as soon as I clock out, it's like he's coming to the office right around then. Yeah, I figured he'd be sleeping right now, <laughs> but he's here with us, and we're happy to have him. Question for you. How are you? How's it going? Uh, I'm okay. Um, you know, it's we've had a, a tonight is one of those big nights uh, where the council is considering the operating budget and a lot of work. Uh, from our team went into putting together uh, all of the the framework there, and it's been uh, very uh, interesting and mostly fun to watch council hmm. uh, kind of grapple with that in the public hearing process. But uh, no, it's uh, you know other than the heat ticking up a little early this year, it's uh, I think we've had a, a good spring, um, and then you know the the hardest part of every day is the. The parts you don't expect, the parts that uh, may involve, uh, you know, unexpected tragedy, um, difficult moments uh, in the departments, but also uh, the best part of every day is going in with a great team and knowing that the Metro workforce uh, is out there working on behalf of the city. Mm -hmm. Now, is it interesting for you because this is, you're on the other side of the budget equation this time. Yeah, I mean, so I think this year may have been... um, Interesting just for that fact. I think um, I knew even when I was still on Metro Council and even thinking about uh, running that the fiscal year 2025 operating budget was going to be tight just given the circumstances. I mean, even we we did a good thing for the city overall a couple of years ago when we created a fund balance policy, which is, you know, basically um, having a rainy day fund for the city that had gotten uh, perilously low uh, in the period right before COVID. And so replenishing that, having that rainy day fund is uh, good fiscal policy, but it also meant we did it in the middle of a revenue cycle. And so mm-hmm. money that we might have otherwise had available this year to come out of the gates and know with confidence that we could cover all of our priorities actually is kind of sitting there in the bank account where you don't want to touch it unless there's a real emergency. And and so I knew that coming into it. So. Um, a lot of this was just looking at how can we continue good programs that are in effect, um, pay people as much as possible given the inflationary pressures that we know so many Nashvillians are experiencing, and then um, you know sort of work with council to make sure that uh, a lot of the priorities that are there, affordable housing, uh, investments in schools that made a lot of use of one-time federal money, Uh, that those things get, you know, that they remain in place. And then um, also while we're preparing for a big citywide conversation about transportation. And um, that that budget that you mentioned, Metro Council is voting on tonight. Budget Chair Delicia Porterfield has introduced a substitute budget. Mm -hmm. How does it differ from yours and how is it similar? So I would say it's similar in that, uh, you know, 99% of what we recommended uh, is in there and, um, what she, I think, tried to do and was pretty successful in was respond to what the Metro Council heard at public hearing. We had to get our recommended budget done by May 1st. Uh, there were a couple things in this budget that weren't available to us ahead of time. Uh, you've probably heard by now the varsity spending plan, mm-hmm. that proposal. Um, Council Member Sepulveda uh, brought this build it right legislation that uh, she wanted some funding for. Um, those two elements of the budget weren't 
something we could even, you know, kind of respond to uh, in time to recommend it. So Chair Porterfield uh, did respond to those uh, specific priorities. And then I think also um, responded to uh, public sector employees uh, concerns, I think, where we felt like we knew we could confidently get to the Metro Human Resources recommendation for cost of living adjustment, get merit pay in there, get some market-based adjustments in there, get the uh, hourly wage floor up to $20 an hour for Metro employees. I think Chair Porterfield uh, and probably a lot of council felt like they wanted to just uh, dig a little deeper to get another half a percent of cost of living. And so I think um, I think she's done a good job stewarding the process. But I'd say you know, the the framework that we put together, I don't think she has chosen to do anything um, that I would say is is disruptive or that I would object to. So I'm, I'm excited to see uh, council consider her budget fully for the first time tonight. So both are going to be on the docket tonight? The way it typically works, and this was true for all but one of the years I was on Metro Council, in fact, all the all of the years that the uh, that Metro has existed for now just over 60 years, you will find the mayor recommends a budget. The chair of the budget and finance committee typically works with that committee to go through uh, member wish list items that may um, you know, may not have either been known to the administration or came from a different community source responding to public hearing. And the chair will frequently offer a substitute. It's the chair's substitute. And usually that is what council fully, is con fully considers. If they don't approve that chair substitute, then the mayor's original recommended budget goes into effect by default. Okay. And, and typically there will be a few million, maybe a few tens of millions of dollars of difference between those. But when you're talking about a $3.2 billion operating budget, um, I think council has effectively responded to priorities in a, in a you know, very responsible margin there. All right. Now we've got a call in from Carolyn in Robertson County. Carolyn, thank you for calling. What is your question for Mayor O'Connell? My question is whether the mayor has plans for contacting mayors of all the counties surrounding Nashville, Davidson County regarding the transit plan to provide public transportation into Davidson County for things like work, doctor's appointments, events, things like that. Yeah, it's a great question and I guess a couple things I'll say. One, I'm very fortunate to have three uh, very intentional regional touch points with other city and county mayors in Middle Tennessee. Uh, I serve on the Regional Transportation Authority and also on the Greater Nashville Regional Council. And then as a part of that, I'm also on the Regional Mayor's Caucus. And so we have three different ways where there's a lot of interaction with other city and county mayors. I was very excited that the um, Regional Transportation Authority, the RTA's executive board, uh, actually recently uh, asked the full RTA board to produce a resolution supporting our transportation plan. One of the things we tried to do in this program was without asking Nashvillians to fully shoulder uh, the burden of regional transportation, make sure that there were meaningful touch points and some service improvements in there. So there are there's a little bit of increase in service to the STAR, which is our one commuter rail route. Uh, and there's, again, a little bit of service increase for uh, some of those RTA commuter coaches, because we know Nashvillians also cross commute. In fact, I used to cross commute out of county uh, professionally. And so we know that regional access to transportation is a priority. But we also know that our obligation here in Nashville and Davidson County is to provide transportation options that serve Nashvillians first and foremost. But we've been very transparent about where those regional touch points are. are. We think that the park and rides, the reintroduction of some express service, some of the corridors we're going to improve signals on. We're working very closely with TDOT as well uh, in development of this program. And so I, I would call it a collaborative effort so far. All right. Thank you so much for your call, Carolyn. Okay, Mayor, I want to ask you this. Tonight at Metro Council is also the first reading out of three of your transit referendum. Right. How is the process ultimately passing through the Metro Council and where is it going after it passes? Like, give us yep. a breakdown of how it ends up on the ballot. Yeah. So if anybody wants to learn more first, I would say go to Nashville.gov slash transit. That's where you can find the overall details of the comprehensive transportation improvement program we're recommending. 
We're doing all of this, Khalil, under state law. Uh, it was a law, bipartisan state legislation passed years ago that's called the Improve Act. And what it says is you can, with the approval of a local legislative body, and then potentially with the approval of voters for the financing of a program, dedicate revenues year over year across a long time horizon, which we can't do right now as a city. Uh, and so we have to bring legislation to the Metro Council. If they approve it, that's kind of step one of a two-step process. If they approve it, then it will be uh, the ordinance that's in front of council right now has language that would then go on to the ballot for voters to consider in November. You do need 27 votes. Um, I'm excited that 32 co-sponsors uh, signed on very early. So first, at first reading, we know that there is a lot of engagement. We have met uh, individually with almost every member of council to talk about the program impacts, especially at the district level for those district council members. Uh, but they will consider that bill on three readings. If they approve it on third reading, then the language that they approve will go to the ballot. It will have to go to the Davidson County Election Commission. But uh, the target date here is November 5th with no. the election in November. All right. We, this is Ask the Mayor with Mayor Freddie O'Connell. If you want to ask your question or address a concern with the mayor, call us at 615-760-2000. We're going to move on to Leanna out in Robertson County. Leanna, welcome. Thank you for calling. What's your question for Mayor O'Connell? Hi, Mayor. My question is about um, the current stadium. Um, so there are a lot of mature trees on that property right now. Um, and I was wondering what the plan was. Um, for what's going to happen when the new stadium is built, and um, what uh, will those be planted somewhere else, or if uh, if I could have one for my own yard? Yeah, I don't know how easy it would be to relocate some of the mature trees. I know that um, we're very fortunate in the past few years that we have grown uh, the tree program within uh, Nashville, so that not only do we have Root Nashville out there uh, still making steady progress on our program to get 500,000 trees planted in Nashville, but also that we've now got uh, urban arborists at all of Metro Water, the codes department and uh, the planning department. So we've got, or sorry, NDOT. And so we've got lots of folks in Metro working on this on a regular basis. Um, I don't know on a per tree basis what is going on with that. I know that the uh, the overall stadium plan is going to wind up with demolition of the old stadium footprint. I do know that uh, the parks element of that, uh, the new East Bank development, is going to be um, something where there will be a ton of trees planted. I expect in the in the long run we'll have a net increase in trees on the East Bank. But I, if you go to nashville.gov slash East Bank, you can find details of what's there. But I'm happy to try to track down uh, details of some of the mature trees for you. Leanna, how many how many trees are you hoping to get? Oh gosh, uh, I, I own a half an acre, so I could maybe support two or three. <laughs> yeah, we can see. I, again, I don't know how easy it is to relocate the the older growth trees, but we can we can certainly take a look for you. I would love that. Awesome. Thanks. Thank you so much for your call, Leanna. Mr. Mayor, let me ask you this. Um, MNPS received ESSER funds, and that's mm -hmm. Elementary Secondary School Emergency Relief Funds. Got them from the federal government, totaling to $425 million. Yeah. These funds end at the end of this month on June 30th, and a lot of cities are facing what's known as the ESSER cliff because yep. the funds are running out. What's the plan to prevent us from falling off that cliff? So that's actually one of the other big reasons why I think this budget year um, felt like we weren't going to be able to go forward with a lot of new initiatives. Some of it is that those new initiatives were actually underway already. Um, we worked very closely with Metro Schools to preserve tens of millions of dollars of some of those programmatic uh, interventions that they offered uh, using ESSER funds. I think... ESSER is what let us actually achieve a long-term goal for the city of having a nurse in every school. 
Uh, so that universal school nurses program is something we're continuing uh, in this budget. Um, they expanded Community Achieves, which is an incredibly important uh, kind of uh, wraparound program that brings community partners into dozens of additional schools beyond where it was piloted several years ago. I think preserving that Community Achieves expansion is a big deal. Uh, we have seen tremendous ex success from the scholars portfolio, including Promising Scholars, which uh, a lot of Metro School students are already enrolled in uh, for this summer, and it's kind of a you know, I think initially it was anticipated there would be a learning recovery scenario for uh, responding to potential learning loss from the period of during the pandemic. Uh, but I think what they've realized that there is a lot of across all of these um, scholars programs, uh, a lot of long term value there and a lot of parent and student satisfaction. So continuing that scholars portfolio is a big deal. Uh, this is also a time when we are uh, expanding on an initial investment in textbooks and instructional materials. I can tell you from firsthand experience, we've had uh, some frustrations at both the elementary and middle school level with uh, instructional materials available to students. So I think this investment is also critically important. So fundamentally, we tried to build an ESSER bridge rather than fall off an ESSER cliff. And I am absolutely there to uh, make sure that programs that we saw a lot of success with. I mean, if you if you think of it this way, it's kind of like ESSER let us pilot several key initiatives within Metro schools. Mm -hmm. We're seeing those things succeed. We want to continue to allow that success. So we did put uh, a lot of emphasis in this budget on making sure we didn't go over that cliff. All right. You're listening to Ask the Mayor with Mayor Freddie O'Connell. Call us at 615-760-2000 to ask your questions. Again, that's 615-760-2000. All right. Speaking about the budget, is there an item on the budget that you propose that may not be getting a lot of attention, people may not know about, but I think that you, th you feel Nashvilleians would deeply appreciate or just think is plain cool? So there are a couple things in there that maybe haven't been as highlighted. And again, I, I, I can't claim any credit for this other than that we wanted to continue recommending them. But we offer universal school lunches here in Nashville. It's been a commitment of Dr. Battle's administration of Metro Schools. There's about $8 million in the overall Metro Schools funding bucket here to make sure that uh, no child goes to school hungry, right? That you have breakfast and lunch there. And that's, I think, an incredibly important, worthwhile, uh, and valuable investment. Um, there's one and a half million dollars in there for uh, continuing to make uh, Vision Zero investments specifically targeted at schools so that our uh, Sidewalks for Schools uh, program continues to advance. So, um, you know, it's some of those things that have been in there that have been not just priorities of mine, but when I was on council, I knew were also uh, priorities for Metro Council. I think making sure that we have another year of $30 million for the Barnes Housing Trust Fund, which has demonstrated its uh, success as one of the most effective uh, ways to create affordable housing uh, in the city is there. Um, I think, you know, as we think about um, the some of the safety challenges we face, we want to make sure we maintain the $1 million investment in community safety. We think uh, Chair Porterfield is going to uh, expand upon that even, and so I think that will be uh, a big, important investment. But, you know, as you go through it, uh, some of what is happening, going back to uh, trees and some other things, there are just a lot of things in progress right now that if you couple them with what we did in our capital spending plan a few months ago, mean that we're doing maintenance in schools, parks, and libraries that has been uh, overdue. And so that now as students get to go into new school facilities like Goodlettsville and James Lawson and three new elementary schools that we're uh, finishing up and, and firefighters get to go into a couple of new fire halls with uh, new emergency vehicles and um, you start to see all of these things add up, the stuff we're buying, the stuff we're investing in across these two budgets. I think um, the continuity of effort here is a, is a big deal. Over the course of the winter, we got hit with some pretty gnarly storms yep. that did a number on our roads. Now, I'm, I'm just asking, as a concerned Nashville driver, yep. is yep. there a little bit of money? Climate change is coming and we can expect our winters to be equally gnarly, if not worse. Is there money set aside to ensure that, you know, the road maintenance, you guys did a great job this year, but I'm sure you're going to have to increase that capacity as we move on. Yeah, and it's a challenge, Khalil, because we we know that for anybody driving down the road, if you're just a motorist in Nashville, you don't really care if it's a city or a state road. Unfortunately, the uh, 
the dollars paying for that pothole recovery, to your point, uh, we are responsible for local roads. At, at a local level, NDOT has done an incredible job uh, responding to the Hub Nashville request. We've gotten our hub coordinator and the hub team have uh, been very serious and attentive to this to the point that we have, since that January winter weather, filled more than 20,000 potholes across the city. Um, we know, though, too, that we've got to prepare the, for the future in a couple of different ways. NDOT does do materials testing. In fact, uh, they often test on the campus right outside their front door uh, with new paving technology and that kind of thing. And so we're preparing in that way. We've also bought uh, additional snow plows, um, some of which have already arrived. So we're prepared for the new winter season in that way as well. Uh, we're also continuing to try to work with our TDOT partners to cover uh, the interstates and state highways, Ellington, Riley, um, the state routes in the city that we can't as easily go and fill the potholes for. Um, but I will also say Kendra Abkowitz on our team, who's our director of sustainability and resilience, I mean, she looks at it uh, from that standpoint of resiliency. We know that some of what we have to do right now is adaptation work, which means we have to be more prepared for uh, flooding at the neighborhood level. We have to be more prepared for uh, tornado seasons that could occur at any time of the year and more regularly um, as we watch kind of where Tornado Alley is drift regionally to include more of the south and a, a longer season. Um, you may have seen what happened in South Florida over the past week where mm -hmm. they got more than two feet of rain in a short amount of time, which is uh, an incredible amount of rainfall. And so tropical storms, even apart from hurricanes, are going to continue to drift inland and we're going to catch some of that. So there is there is some resiliency planning there. Our Office of Emergency Management is involved in that. Our Metro Water Department uh, is involved in that. So we are we are looking at the future. I and all the Nashvilleans on the roads appreciate the work that you're doing. We're going to go to break, but before we do, we know, Leanna, you were listening, you asked a question. The mayor's office would love to follow up with you to learn more and talk about these stadium trees. We weren't able to get a screenshot of your number, so if you can give us a call, we will get that information to the mayor's office so you all can be in contact. That's 615-760-2000. Leanna, we're looking to hear from you. All right, we're going to take a short break. When we return, we'll continue to field your calls from Nashville Mayor Freddie O'Connell. If you are on the line, hold on the line. We will get to your calls after we come back from this break. Just call 615-760-2000. This is Nashville. Stay with us. Funding for This is Nashville comes from you, our listeners, and Music City Prep Clinic, Nashville-based provider for prep and offering comprehensive sexual health services in an environment designed to be safe, professional, and shame-free. Learn more at musiccityprep.org. I'm Khalil A. Colonna, and this is Nashville. Today, it's Ask the Mayor with Mayor Freddie O'Connell. If you have a question or comment, call us at 615-760-2000. The lines are filling up, but hold on. Mr. Mayor makes it a point to get to everyone's phone call. Okay, we're going to take another call. You ready, Mr. Mayor? I am ready. All right, Kelly from Germantown. What is your question? Thanks for calling. Oh, hi. Um, hey, Freddie. Hello, um, Kelly. I, hey, I have a question about the operational kind of process of hub. Um, Germantown, you know, we have great mixed-use development neighborhood where we have businesses and homes right together. And um, sometimes if you have a neighbor who's a business owner or a property owner or something like that, and they are not necessarily taking care of their property, when you submit a ticket through hub, let's say they have five-foot-tall weeds or something, Yep. Um, and code sends someone out, and they agree, yep, and they go through the process to say, yep, this is in violation. The very next step in the process is a 30-day waiting period. Yep. So between, so, you know, so basically, the you know, whoever has called, reported this, um, has to wait 30 days for an inspector to come back, and the the let's say neglectful business owner is notified of when to expect that inspector to come back. And I just feel like the system is kind of setting up 
um, homeowners and people who live here, like the burden is on us to kind of constantly deal with this. And it's also conditioning, let's say, business owners or ne- neglectful property investors or whatever to continue to not care about the property until they're absolutely forced to. So I'm just kind of wondering if there's like some sort of operational process in here that could be addressed. Kelly, it's a it's a great question, and I will tell you it was one of the most frustrating things as a district council member uh, to deal with, and we dealt with it in uh, multiple of the neighborhoods that I represent. And and to your point, I mean it it's a challenge. So, um, it, on anything from property standards to abandoned vehicles, there is a waiting period, and we're lucky. But I'd say. Most of the property owners in our wonderful collection of urban mixed-use neighborhoods do a pretty good job. But uh, as you are aware, there are some property owners who are less responsible, less attentive, uh, and certainly care less about the impact on the community. And it is a little bit of a challenge because I think legally uh, there is a need to kind of give an opportunity to respond. But um, as we have kind of tightened up some of the things around development services, it's had a lot to do with... Uh, improvements in the codes process. I will say too, though, um, we have seen really great use of Hub, and I think the more uh, people uh, are starting to use that, that these are now property owners that aren't um, able to kind of take advantage of no one paying attention. And, and I, I grant, like, it is tough for uh, us to assume that there's this giant core of responsible citizen volunteers. Uh, reporting these things. But I will say, I mean, even as a council member, Hub Nashville turned into the tool I use to do a lot of the constituent service work or just community improvement work that I wanted to see throughout the district. And the good news is it gives us data. It lets us know who uh, those less responsible property owners are if you see a pattern. Uh, One of the hard parts that we have, again, looked at ways to try to resolve is that we're currently limited under state law to a $50 per incident fine. And this turns out for a lot of people to be, to feel like a little more than a slap on the wrist. So even if you tighten up the process, I think um, the the sense that you're getting someone to comply, um, it winds up just being a little bit frustrating for them. And I think that's, that's also a part of the challenge, but it, it's something I'm continuing to work on. It's something that I know um, I share your frustration because I, uh, I had to deal with it on multiple, multiple occasions for particularly those places that are chronically irresponsible from a property standpoint. So I would say my encouragement to you would be keep, do please keep reporting that stuff to Hub, but um, that also lets codes know kind of who those repeat offenders are. And I think there is, there's an opportunity for precision there when we learn from data who chronic offenders are, we can Um, start to be proactive. That's one of the things I'm also, I I started working on that when I was on Metro Council and continue to do that as mayor. We'd we'd love to have Metro be in a position where even if we don't have full capacity to be on every block uh, in the city every day to be proactive, when you know uh, where those flashpoints are in the community, they're most likely to be problematic. If you put your attention there first voluntarily, you don't have to wait for those Hub Nashville reports to come from Germantown. And so uh, we, we do want to aspire to get to that point. All right, Kelly, thank you so much for your call. We are going to go to Keith. Keith, what is your call, my friend? Thanks for calling. Keith is out in Hillsborough, West End. Uh, now... <laughs> Since the previous caller talked about Hub Nashville, I've got multiple questions. Um, I live on a corner street in Hillsborough West End where they just put in permit parking last summer on 26th Avenue. And Vanderbilt construction workers and employees continue to still park on the street since there's no enforcement. And... I have done Hub Nashville requests and spoken to the council person and all that, and still nothing seems to change on that front. That's my first question, is what can happen. The second is um, the East Bank. Uh, Oracle has announced that they're moving their headquarters from Austin to Nashville, And my understanding is they were sort of radio silent with the previous administration and have not had much communication with your administration. So is it sort of pie in the sky? Is it going to happen? And following up on that, 
Um, Nashville flooded in 2010, and we're about to do this big building project on the East Bank and all that. So what is Nashville government thinking or doing in terms of hopefully preventing another flooding of downtown or the East Bank? And it may have a a higher elevation. Yeah, thanks. All right, we'll try to take all three of those uh, in order. So on the first one, uh, we'll take a look at the 26th Avenue. I will say when uh, the Nashville Department of Transportation, NDOT, brought uh, the parking modernization proposal to council a couple of years ago, one of the things that I think we were all told and expected was an increase uh, in enforcement, including in those areas that were opting in to residential permit parking. So we'll make a note of it. Um, Aaron Williams is our incredible hub coordinator uh, in the mayor's office, works closely with uh, multiple departments. And so we can try to see what's going on over there. Um, and, you know, the reality is we probably do need to just make sure we uh, get some focal attention on that from an enforcement standpoint. So we'll we'll take a look at that because it's it was something that we were uh, told to expect was that with approval of that parking program, we would see an increase in enforcement. So we'll track that down for you. Um, we did get an opportunity to meet with Oracle. They reached out uh, a few months into the term, um, and it does sound like they, I, I will say, I think uh, – Larry Ellison's announcement surprised uh, people in the company as well as uh, people in Austin. But I don't think it's going to be the kind of thing that uh, one day people in Austin will wake up and suddenly a whole bunch of uh, that city's, uh, you know, Oracle workforce will suddenly find themselves relocated to Nashville. It, It sounds to me like they're Uh, looking to do as much hiring of local talent as they possibly can. Uh, They are staffing up already. Uh, They do have a workforce presence here in Nashville. Uh, But it does sound like that is a legitimate thing. Again, I think they will have a long-term presence both on the West Coast and in Austin. But I think Oracle is going to be an increasingly major employer. The original deal uh, that resulted in their massive investment here uh, expected about 8,500 jobs uh, over a, you know a 25 year period. Um, so I think they're going to steadily try to climb toward that. I think they're going to uh, have a lot of exciting opportunities with local colleges and universities, and probably uh, look to partner in a lot of different ways with the city as they build out a, a full workforce here. And then to your point, meaning knowing that we have a lot of redevelopment opportunities on the East Bank in areas that have either been lightly developed or not developed at all, um, we have met constantly with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, and we are uh, potentially expecting some floodplain revisions from the Corps. Uh, we're trying to be prepared for those. That probably will mean uh, a slight elevation uh, increase for at least some portion of the East Bank, but I think um, Metro Water... Uh, has worked very hard on overall resiliency and going back to the 2010 flood. uh, They did develop a unified flood preparedness program Uh, throughout the city. They have done land buyouts. They have done um, infrastructure improvements. They have, you know, started the, they they recapitalized parts of their stormwater program. Uh, So I think there has been a lot of work done already on the ground around the city uh, to prepare for future events. But I think also communication has improved with the Corps. When we had recent high rain events, uh, we we knew as a city uh, well in advance by co- communicating consistently with the Corps where we could kind of expect uh, river levels to settle out and when. And so uh, Metro Water, the city, OEM, uh, we were all able to be better prepared for that, but I think we're also preparing for it in the development process. All right, Keith, thank you so much for your call. Mr. Mayor, if you need some part-time help in monitoring Keith's neighborhood in the parking, um, I could be available. I was a pretty good hall monitor in the sixth grade. I think the hard part is I doubt we could deputize you to write tickets, and that's <sighs> what that's what Keith is looking for. I think. Okay. Oh, can I, next I think time. he can. Uh, Keith is. It sounds to me like Keith is not having any difficulty identifying violators. Yes, not at all. Not at all. All right, we're going to go to our last call for you guys. I know you're busy and you have meetings. We're going to go to Winston, Winston in South Nashville. Winston, thank you for calling. I understand you have a special program that you'd like to mention. Could you briefly tell us about this program for Mayor O'Connell? Yes, this is a a Section 125 of the IRS code that um, would bring $573 back to the city government every year and uh, about $125 per month increase in salary 
while complementing the health benefits of the city. Um, and I'd like to know who we should talk to about this program uh, and who he would direct us to so that we could get our corporate people. We take care of people like uh, Amazon and folks like that, and we think this could help bring the budgetary issues um, with the tens of thousands of people that are, are employed in, in uh, Nashville. Um, multiply that times 573 per year per employee for each W-2 full-time employee. That brings us some money back to the city. And uh, we'd like to see that happen and see the city employees get the benefits of this kind of program. Who would you direct us to, sir? Winston, my my best guess from what you're describing would be someone in Metro Human Resources. If you'll send a note describing uh, the program over to mayor at Nashville.gov, we can get you uh, connected to the right person. Thank you very much. Usually it goes to budgetary because they're the ones most excited about this. Yeah, it Sometimes may be finance, resources. but if it has to do with the workforce, it may be human resources. But we'll take a look at yeah. the details of it and, and get back so to you. I would you. send this to human resources? I would just send a note describing it to mayor at Nashville.gov, and we'll we'll figure out if it makes more sense for finance or HR or both and, and point it in the right direction and get you pointed in the right direction. Mayor.gov. Mayor Thank at you, Nashville.gov. Thank you so much for your call, Winston. That's all for the time we have with Mayor O'Connell. Tune in next month. He'll be back. You will be back, right? I will be back. And uh, I know you mentioned earlier Juneteenth. We'll be out at Fort Negley tomorrow for the uh, celebration. And just so everybody is aware, it is uh, Juneteenth is now a metro holiday. So we will have a lot of our workforce taking tomorrow off. Uh, and I will be out there at Fort Negley in the evening for the festivities out there. I will be seeing you there. All right. Many thanks to Mayor Freddie O'Connell for being with us. Let's take one more short break. When we come back, we'll talk with Nashville's nightmare, Mr. Benton McDonough, to learn what the nightmare does. And you can ask him questions as well about downtown. Call us at 615-760-2000. And you could always join the conversation by tweeting us at This Is Nashville. We'll be right back. I'm Khalil Ekelona, and this is Nashville. Now, late last year, we here at This Is Nashville collaborated with Nicole Williams to air a segment titled Inside the Council Chambers. It was a recap on all the happenings down at Metro Council. It was informative and a lot of fun. I, along with many others, learned about our local government, how it works, and the people who work there. In one of the segments, Nicole introduced us to the job of the nightmare. It's a position that many didn't know existed. I feel like it was a vigilante superhero who's dedicated to making sure downtown Nashville is safe for all people to gather and proceed to get drunk, maybe. However, as Nicole advises, us, this position is very, very real. And it's held by someone who's working hard to make sure that downtown is safe for Nashvillians and tourists alike. So who is our nightmare? His name is Benton McDonough, and he's here in the studio. Allow me to welcome Nightmare McDonough to This Is Nashville. It's good to have you here, sir. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Khalil. I appreciate you inviting me today. Really great to have you. If you want to ask a question to Nightmare McDonough, you can call us at 615-760 to get through this. All right, but we're going to break this down. What is the official title is the Mayor's Office of Nightlife? What is it and why was it started? Well, some some people call it the uh, the Nightmare position and and uh, uh, you know, when when you're in the south and you're saying nightmare, you know, a lot of times, um, you know, people may take the take that the wrong way. So um, yes, um, but really, it's it's a position that uh, acts as a liaison between uh, business owners and their employees, residents, visitors, and their interaction with uh, with metro government. And so, really looking at quality of life issues uh, regarding noise, cleanliness, and uh, public safety for for one. What are the hours? We're not like keeping you up. You're not normally asleep at this time, are you? <laughs> Uh, it, it really depends. Um, some some nights, uh, usually from about Thursday to to Sunday, uh, my schedule can can range um, as far as hours go. I mean, usually uh, Monday through through Wednesday is pretty uh, pretty straightforward. Um, but I, I do have uh, other meetings with. Um, I'm also the director of the beer board, so I've got 
uh, those those meetings going on regularly, and then I also have uh, different community meetings going on throughout the throughout the week. So it it really differs from from week to week and, and day to day, which is what I really love about the position. You're director of the beer board. Is that a connection to how you got this gig? I you know. I, the interesting thing that that I found is that Nashville is very different from other cities in in many ways. One of those being how they came up with with the position. A lot of times, uh, you'll, you'll find individuals that uh, that that have worked for years in you know the nightlife, uh, uh, you know nightlife, and uh, you know in restaurants and uh, that that sort of thing. And so, I, I came came to the position from a regulatory standpoint, and so. I'm the director of the the beer board, and so we regulate the sale of beer. And so we have those connections really already set up with you know with the bars and 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 restaurants. And so um, I, I think with with this position and this appointment, it, it really helped that that I had those contacts and those relationships already mm-hmm. already built in. On top of knowing a lot of how how metro government and state government operate on on a on a daily basis, and so I'm able to plug in and and know the different playmakers and the individuals that that make the decisions and be able to uh, interact with them and and uh, get you know get time in front of them to to be able to make the the changes and improvements that we really need to in the city all right that's pretty cool we do have a caller we've got lisa out in eighth avenue in wedgwood lisa thank you for calling what is your question for nightmare mcdonough hi thanks for taking my call um i'll ask this one and i have a follow-up um what is the geographic footprint of the nightlife division's oversight? Thank you for that question, Lisa. That's that's um, that's a very interesting point. We primarily started the position started in the entertainment district, and uh, so we were primarily focused, at least for the first year, or two um, there in, in Broadway and and that area around around the entertainment district, and so. Uh, what we've been able to do is uh, is hire a uh, community outreach coordinator, which we we did back in in May, and that's an individual who can focus on on the area around Broadway, and then that allows the the rest of the team to be able to to really expand out to areas outside of the the district. And so, uh, it is a countywide office and position. So we you know we're we're always working with. Individuals and neighborhoods that um, that have concerns with uh, nightlife issues, and so we have several that we're working on currently. Okay, great. So, and Mayor um, McConnell just answered my the fifty dollar uh, noise violation fee question that right. is mind bogglingly um, <laughs> mandated by the legislature. Um, so, which we all know is basically a cover charge and two drinks um, for a customer. So, it's not a deterrent for any business to keep its noise down. Um, so what is the next step um, for a resident and residents within neighborhoods? Because we have a bar in our neighborhood that they've been fined many, many times. Because, again, $50 is nothing. Another friend lives off Nolansville on Elysian Field. There's a restaurant bar there that has constant um, dance music, which is also affecting all them negatively. So what can a citizen, a resident within the neighborhood do to help this business to be either soundproofed or, you know, stop affecting the our nightlife, you know, not being able to sleep, listen to movies while um, we're at home. Right. You know, do we contact this coordinator or how does, how does one or Metro address this issue for residents? No, those, those, those are really good questions. And, and, you know, the, the $50 uh, fine is, is uh, it, it's something that, um, uh, that has been an obstacle to to us for um, for a long time. It's actually in the state constitution that you can't can't assess anything higher than a fifty dollars fine without granting a, a jury trial to uh, to that individual. So, um, you know that that's kind of what we're what we're running into. And so, really, what we found, you know, we worked with other other nightlife establishments and other other music venues to. Uh, to really address the need to be a, a good neighbor, and so what what I found is that once we sit down with them face to face, and and they realize that the office of nightlife is, is actually there to help them, you know, promote their business and and support their business, but also work with them to be good neighbors to to the uh, residents around them. You know, we've had really good luck 
in uh, in that case. We we had one situation in uh, Hillsborough Village, and we had a, a club that had multiple complaints every every weekend when they opened. And so we we actually met with the uh, the owners of the of the property, and I I can tell you over the last four weeks we've had maybe one com- one noise complaint that's come in. So. I, I would make sure to reach out to uh, to our office. You can you can reach us at uh, nightlife at nashville.gov. So you can email us there, or you can uh, call us at 615-862-6751. All right, Lisa, thank, thank you so okay. much for that call, Lisa. Really appreciate it. And you know, let me ask you this. There's, there's been some high-profile inc- incidents over the years. Riley Strain. Um, right. The case, the two fatalities at the hands of bar security, they come to mind a lot. And today, the results of Riley Strain's autopsy were released by Tennessee's chief medical examiner, which concluded the cause of death was accidental, quote, drowning and ethanol intoxication. These things, they got to weigh pretty heavy on you. Oh, oh, for sure. Uh, You know, I I remember, uh, you know, when I first was thinking about taking this this position, you know, I, I told myself that, you know, there were going to be really good days and there were going to be really bad days. And, mm-hmm. uh, no one can prepare you for, you know, what, what's going to happen on, you know, situations like a Riley strain situation. And, and so all, all you can try to do is to be proactive and try to think about these possible things that, that might happen and, and, uh, prevent them. And so, and, and obviously to learn from, you know the, the the terrible tragedies that that happen, um, s- such as with Mr. Strain, and so you know we're we're looking at at different um, you know d- different opportunities as far as training, different initiatives for uh, for Broadway to make it you know a safer safer place for people to to visit and to to enjoy their time down there. We also saw you had some thoughts on the Morgan Wallen uh, chair throwing incident. Um, and it's not the first time it's happened. Two years before Morgan Wallen's arrest, a Vandy student was injured by a chair toss from a bar rooftop downtown. Right. What options is your office pursuing to that may prevent this sort of thing from happening again? You know, as far as the uh, the issue specific to to, to Mr. Wallen, uh, you know, we we did, um, in, you know, in discussion with the the beer board, they did grant a temporary permit to. Uh, to the ownership um, uh, for that particular club, and um, you know they're they're going to come before the the beer board to provide evidence of the fact that you know they'll they'll be operating in a in a safe manner and and uh, that that Mr. Wallen is not actually uh, you know an owner as far as the day to day activity goes. So that's um, that that's something that um, that we're we're looking at through the and that's that's where my job through the beer board actually comes in. Mm. Very useful in in uh, in these situations, but uh, you know, I, I think the uh, the rooftops, you know, are are something that um, you know we're we're working with the bar owners and uh, their security staff to to be able to head those thing those situations off and and uh, be able to address them before anything major of of that magnitude happens again. Has there been conversations about requiring safety netting on all of the buildings down there? Uh, all of our options are are on the table as far as that that goes. So that that's you know that's something that's that's been raised. But you know what the final answer and decision is on that. You know only time will tell. All right, a couple couple we only have a couple more minutes left, and let me ask you a few questions. Parking, 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 parking. Um, a lot of musicians have complained about the cost of parking. People who play down there, um, they get a certain amount of money for their gigs. They say that parking is all the money they make for that night. I know personally when I go to downtown for events, I'd rather take a ride share than park because it's often cheaper than that. Your office recently worked on some a pilot program to reduce parking payments. You're trying to get that implemented. How how is that working out for the musicians and people who work downtown? You know, it's it's gone very very well. Um we implemented it starting in uh, February and uh, it provides a 60% discount to the musicians who are playing downtown and uh, allows them to uh, use a, a QR code that that uh, that we provide every every month or that that uh, uh, the parking company provides every month and uh, I know in the um, first 
month, I want to say that they saved about $1,000 on on parking um, mm. just in, in that amount of time. I Unfortunately, I don't have the updated data on that, but I, I'm, I'm happy to provide that once once I have that. Excellent. Thank you so much. So just about 30 seconds left. What's your favorite part about the job? Really, it's just getting out and uh, meeting with the people like this, this situation here, you know, um, com- coming on uh, on your show and, and being able to reach out and uh, really get to get my message out to, to everyone that, that we're, we're here to help. And, you know, if anyone has any ideas about how the Office of Nightlife can uh, make, make everyone's lives better, feel free to reach out to us. I want to thank you so much. I want to thank Mayor Nightmare, Benton McDonough, our nightmare for coming on to the show. He's not a myth. He's not Batman, but he's very real and he cares. Um, thank you very much. I know you got a shift tonight, so you're probably going to get some sleep. Really appreciate you being here. Thank you. All right. Thanks to you for tuning in this hour. This is Nashville is a production of Nashville Public Radio. Today's episode was produced by Catherine Cece's and Mary Mancini. It was directed by Tasha A.F. Lemley. Our technical director and board operator is Liv Lombardi. The masterminds behind our theme music are LaRange and Namir Blade. You can listen back at thisisnashville.org or wherever you get good podcasts. This is Nashville. I'm Khalil Le Colonna. We'll see you on Thursday, everybody. And oh, oh, speaking of Thursday, This is Nashville is holding a live event at Vanderbilt's Blair School of Music. Get ready for an evening full of fun. Special guests, very special guests. Melissa Joan Hart and Ashley McBride will join us to be in conversation. We'll feature music by Mike Floss and Alex Barnes, as well as comedy by Amber Autry and Brad Sativa. You can purchase your tickets now at WPLN.org slash T-I-N live. That's slash T-I-N L-I-V-E. This is Nashville. I'm Khalil Le Colonna. We'll see you on Thursday, everybody. And be good to each other.